Well, on behalf of the Friends of the Scranton Public Library Poetry Series, I'd like to welcome you to tonight's reading. Before my introduction of William Hay and uh, just a couple of announcements, first of all, one of us on the committee for this series of readings is interested in, a, in running a writing workshop in September in the Poconos. And anyone who would be interested in signing up for, for that or just interested in receiving information about it, if you could please sign your name, a piece of paper out on the table outside. Also, the Mulberry Poets and Writers Association is going to be having a reading this coming Monday evening, April 13th, uh, readings by Juan Amador and Kate Potter, and a short talk by Linda Ledford Miller on Chicano poetry. This evening, I have William Hayen with us, who was born in Brooklyn and has spent much of his life now at the State University of New York College at Brockport, where he is currently a professor of English and poet in residence. Uh, he has written seemingly countless volumes of, of poetry, many uh, uh, very well-printed small press books and quite a few major collections, including, and with a great deal of, of variety too, ranging from the, uh, some haiku influence poetry in a book called Lord Dragonfly, uh, a book called Erica po Poems of the Holocaust, dealing with Nazi Germany and the Holocaust. Most recently, a book called The Chestnut Rain, containing many evocations of uh, rural life. Also a, what he calls a romance, a, a short novel, if you will, Vic Holyfield and the Class of 1957. Many other books as well, so I'm interested to see what of the many kinds of writing and poetry that he does he will be reading for us this evening. This time, please introduce William Hay. <laughs> Okay, I'll just put this up here somewhere. I, uh, I get this cable television channel at home and I see these uh, representatives talking to an empty chamber, you know, I feel sort of like that. I can't help this, I was just thinking of this. I always do at least one imitation. Who's this? Did you get that one? Uh, Dave said he wondered what I was going to do. I sort of do too. But I'm going to uh, <coughs> I'm going to begin by reading you the best thing I've ever written. How's that? And after this, it will be downhill. Two or three years ago, for the when I was a kid, I wrote a novel that was so bad I never bothered to type it up. And uh, after that, for I don't know, 20 years or 25 years, I concentrated on the lyric poem. It was the thing I wanted to do. I was obsessed with the poem that was a page or two long. But uh, two or three years ago, I started writing fiction again. Stories and uh, a little thing that I call a romance, although I have uh, more ambition for it than for these things that, uh, these things called romances by Barbara Cartland and those kinds of people. Um, when I when I uh, wrote that novel or romance, it was a story I had in my mind for a long time, for years. I wanted to tell a story about maybe the richest man in the country who would, uh, he's, he's from Texas in electronics and gun running and everything, but he goes to Long Island and he sees that his old high school is up for auction. You know, as many high schools are around the country with diminishing students. So he buys his old high school and uh, refurbishes it and invites all of his classmates from the class of 1957 back for a year-long reunion. That's what my story was about. And there are other complications, too. You find out that the guy who tells the story, a member of the class of 1957, uh, was a good friend of Elvis Presley, and much of the book is about music and that kind of thing. Anyway, uh, I put off writing that story for years and years, and uh, I finally sat down and wrote it over about three weeks. In order to write it, I gave myself three pieces of advice. I had three, three slips of uh, paper in front of me. Uh, and I referred to these slips whenever I got stuck in the way I used to get stuck when I wrote fiction. On the first slip, I had simplicity. I wanted to tell the thing as simple as possible. 
Other times when I tried to write fiction, I'd endlessly polish the first sentence, you know. I just couldn't get past it. I was like, I was still writing poetry, even though I was trying to just tell a simple story. On the second slip of paper, I had velocity. That's a word from the poet, uh, I got it from the poet Linda Paston, you know. She wants velocity in her poems. She wants them to move fast. And on the third slip of paper, I had John Gardner's famous definition now of fiction. Fiction is a vivid and continuous dream. So I wanted to get lost in this story, tell it simply, tell it fast, and just uh, speak in sort of a, Joyce Carol Oates says that fiction is written in a state of semi-trance. I wanted to go into sort of a semi-trance and tell it. I could always go back and fix it up later. But for that first draft, I wanted to blast my way through it. And I did, and it turned out okay. So, uh, and, and uh, lately, the last six months or so, I've become fascinated with what seems to be a new form in American writing, the short, short story, the very short story. A book that was picked as one of the 10 best books of uh, last year by at least one newspaper came out called Sudden Fictions. That was the definition for the story that came out very quickly and hit you in two or three pages. You can, I mean, it seems to me that that kind of story is very close to a poem in some ways. You have to leave certain things out. You can't spend a lot of time on characterization or on setting. One critic says that uh, what, you, what you have to do is to deal with situations that are almost archetypal. You know, I, I haven't done this or read one like this, but you know, a father takes his son in for his first haircut or something like that. You don't have to spend a lot of time describing the barber shop. Maybe you can get to the story and tell it in two or three pages. Anyway, this form fascinates me. And I think it's going to be the form of the next 10 or 20 or 30 years if we find something new to do. Well, I've written a bunch of these little short shorts, and a couple of weeks ago I really got lucky with one, I think. Or maybe a couple of months ago. And I'm going to read you this little story, okay? It's only uh, almost three pages long, that's all. It's written in a highfalutin, highfalutin sort of voice that isn't mine. You know, it's a little bit elegant, I think. Um, Again, and my poems aren't like this, I think, but you'll be able to understand this. It's called Roseville. Roseville sounds like a town, doesn't it? And I, I use the name Roseville in a couple other stories. But here it refers to something that, in fact, my wife collects. It's, a, it's an art pottery. People, uh, antique dealers, have pieces of Roseville. It goes all the way back to the teens. But a lot of people collect the stuff that came out in the 40s, little vases and bowls with flower designs and things on them, okay? I think that's all you have to know about this. And uh, again, this is the best thing I ever wrote. Uh, you, I think you have to pay attention. This has only, only has three paragraphs, okay, which fits in with the story. I like this because it serves as a parable of the short, short story. This is about the short, short story itself. At one point, the speaker says, to make a long story short, I think that would make a good title for an anthology of fiction. But anyway, listen to this little story. Anything else I have to explain about this little thing? I use the word ordure, you know, which is sort of dung. It's not sort of, it is. It's filth, <laughs> it's filth or dung or something like that. Okay. Roseville. Karen Dunkel had been browsing Paradise Mall's annual antique show and sale. She'd been looking carefully at a piece of Roseville pottery she was thinking of buying, a small blue bowl in the white rose pattern from the 40s, an object you could turn in your hands to feel the cyclic pattern of roses and vines in their imperishable frieze. But was that a chip in its base or just a natural kiln fleck of some kind that wouldn't affect its value? She'd been browsing and concentrating on white roses when Conrad Glimmerman, walking past her, thinking of a Miss Lonely Hearts column he'd read that morning, slipped on a spot of mustard and knocked her forward against three tiers of glassware and pottery while he himself fell not on his back with his feet thrown up in front of him as is usually depicted in slapstick cartoons, but somehow, as we've observed, 
to Karen's side, his left leg striking her in the back of her knees so that she seemed, as the antique glassware and pottery swept over them in a wave of shards and slivers, to be planning to sit on Conrad, which she did. By the time the smashing and tinkling of breakage had stopped, when the last carnival glass tumbler had rolled to a still point and the last cut glass ashtray had stopped cracking and spinning, Karen, the Roseville bowl that Conrad would later buy for her intact in her hands, looked down at Conrad, who was afraid to move, and said, I don't believe we've been introduced. To make a long story short, it is a week later. By now, Karen and Conrad have exhausted all jokes about their first meeting, have told and retold those few seconds to both circles of their friends in such slow motion and with so many variations that it seemed only natural to them that Karen should end up sitting on Conrad's buttocks in Paradise Mall in the way she had, bits of amethyst glass sequined on her bouffant. Miraculously, however uncomfortable such fleeting notoriety might have made them, neither had been even slightly hurt during this adventure, while Conrad could think only of the dog ordure into which he must, he thought, have stepped, could only hope that said dreck was not beneath him at that very moment. After three dates, Karen and Conrad have worn the story out. In fact, they swear to one another that they will never again tell this story to themselves or anyone else, that it will remain their own silent secret, that if they ever argue or find themselves glum or heartbroken, they will look at one another and smirk, knowing what the other is remembering. They will cherish the story of their first meeting as a defensive weapon, a shotgun, so to speak, with barrel inscribed with their credo, one that words can only approximate. Two of them might be comedy and contingency, but we will not attempt an aphorism here. To make a very long story much shorter, however, we now see them on their golden wedding anniversary. As life would have it, it is after dinner, and frail Karen is standing at a microphone behind a three-tiered wedding cake at the Senior Center, which their children and friends have rented for the celebration. Just tall enough to see over the cake, she is looking out at this congregation and beginning to say a few words. Conrad, who broke his left hip a few months before, forgetful now and beginning to lose track of things, prone to wandering aimlessly about, stands up from his chair at the head table and begins walking behind Karen. A curve of blue begins to form in the back of his mind. He is thinking of telling a story. And what do you think, what do you, what do you think is going to happen to old Conrad at that point? You know, you, you noticed how I planted that hip, hip operation he had. Poor Conrad is going to collapse into Karen. At one point, you know, there was three tiers of antiques. Now, 50 years later, a three-tiered wedding cake. And he's about to go into her again. When I read the ending of this thing, you see, you have fun with your own writing. I want to laugh at the whole thing, and I want to cry at it. Because here 50 years have gone by in the blink of an eye, just like that, in this story. And the poor guy is about to, about to go in there again. Boy, I like that one. You know, I didn't know what it was going to be about. You sort of begin writing and then see what happens. And sometimes when you're done, you say, well, nothing happens there. And sometimes you're done and you look at it and you say, boy, I got lucky that time. That one's OK. So I don't know. Uh, I guess I'll just uh, read some poems. <laughs> anything on your mind about that story or about anything I said so far? <laughs> uh, I often begin poetry readings with this poem. I was brought up on Long Island. And this is a, I spent my boyhood around ponds. This is called The Crane at Gibbs Pond. The boy stood by the darkening pond, watching the other shore. Against pines, a ghostly crane floated from side to side, crooning. Maybe its mate had drowned. 
Maybe its song lamented the failing sun. Maybe its plaint was joy, heart-stricken praise for its place of perfect loneliness. Maybe, hearing its own echoing, taking its own phantom gliding the sky mirror of the pond for its lost mother in her other world, it tried to reach her in the only way it could. Maybe, as night diminished all but the pond's black radiance, the boy standing there knew he would someday sing of the crane, the crane's song, and the soulful water. And uh, this is a little poem. I, I had this in, a, in an obscure little uh, limited edition, and I'd forgotten all about this little poem until a, an ex-student of mine stood up at this poetry gathering and he recited this poem and it sounded familiar to me. And he, d he d didn't say who it was by until he was done. And he told me something about it and now I, I never thought I'd resurrect this poem, but now I think this little poem might be one that I'll use as the first poem in a selected poem someday. You know, I've done eight or ten books of poems, I guess, and it's time that I thought about the best ones and bringing those together. And the, the more I thought about this little poem, it, it'll seem just innocuous at first, I guess, you know. A good poem ought to be like a little drop or a curve ball. I don't know what the right image would be. A uh, disappearing ball, maybe. Uh, but the more I thought about it, it seemed to say many of the things that I think maybe I've been up to. I only want to understand imperfectly what I'm really up to, but when I think of this poem, it seems to me to stand for some of the things on my mind. It's a little poem called The Eye. I don't know if this has ever happened to you. Have you, have you ever written with a pen with sunlight coming in and the clip on the pen or the pen itself catches some of the sunlight and spins, spins light on your page? Has that ever happened to you? Well, I guess it could happen to you if you used a spoon or something like that. Anyway, The Eye. As I begin, not knowing what to write, the sun from the clip on my pen turns on this page such a streaked burst gold eye all I have all I have ever wanted for you to see this to see with this in case it is dark where you live so the guy doesn't know listen as I begin not knowing what to write that's my general sense of the writing I've done in my lifetime I don't know what's going to happen, as in that story. I had no idea. As I begin, not knowing what to write, the sun, something happens from the clip on my pen, from your pen, turns on this page. Such a streaked, burst, gold eye. Pretty image, huh? I like pretty poems. Phil Levine said, Retke could write pretty poems, and he couldn't, right? He writes tough poems. I like pretty poems still. They're out of fashion, but I like them. Such a streaked, burst, gold eye. And the guy says, all I have, all I have ever wanted. It's a burst, gold eye. The poet Retke says, I'll make a broken music or I'll die. Such a streaked, burst, gold eye. All I have, all I have ever wanted. And then he shares, for you to see this. What else is our writing except an attempt to have other people see what we have? Huh? For you to see this, to see with this. How about that? The poem as a means of perception, we hear that all the time. You see things through the poem. Wallace Stevens says, the tongue is an eye. Doesn't that sound stupid? The tongue is an eye. The tongue is a means of perception, huh? For you to see this, to see with this. And then why? In case it is dark where you live. Something like that. That still holds up for me. I'm glad I just thought about that again. So uh, poetry as consolation. I'd like to think of that. Or I'd like a book of poems to be of use somehow, to help somebody. The only purpose uh, for poetry, Wallace Stevens says, is to help people to live their lives. How about that? We don't hear that kind of talk very much. I, I hadn't thought of this, but I'm going to read you a nasty poem. There's some, there's some poets in the audience here. I'm going to read a nasty poem. The one controversial poem I've ever written, probably. Especially if I find it. Uh, so, some of you folks won't understand a lot of the references here, okay, but it's an angry poem called The New American Poetry. 
This was in Triquarterly Magazine. I got a lot of letters, and so did they. And there have been a, and then they published an anthology of the best from Triquarterly's 20 years. And at least two reviews I saw. The reviewers talked about this poem and went to the left of it and went to the right of it, saw this as the thing that stirs up the questions, you know. I was reading uh, the letters of Archibald MacLeish, and he said that contemporary poets hold up models for, ye for the young of a withering heartlessness. There's something so elusive, so nastily non-communicative about contemporary poetry that it has lost its audience. Who cares anymore? Who cares? Because nobody can understand it to begin with. So when I read that in MacLeish, a great, a great late poet, he lived to be 89 years old, a whole poet, then uh, this poem was written out sort of fast, and I realized what had been festering in me for so long, you know. I'll read this. You'll catch the tone if, if not a lot of these uh, references. So this is called The New American Poetry. It is the poetry of the privileged class. It inherits portfolios. It was born in the Ivy League and inbred there. Its parents filled its homes with bubbling Bach, silver and crystal brightnesses for its surfaces. It does not hear the cheap and natural music of the cow. That's what Henry Thoreau said. He said he loved the cheap and natural music of the cow. Its vases hold platinum-stemmed roses, not ponds with logs from which turtles descend at our approach, neckfold leeches shining like black droplets of blood. It swallows Paris and Athens, tracks its genes to the armory show. A lot of people go back to the armory show. What was it, in the teens? and trace modern art to the armory show. As it waits by their coffins in the parlor, it applies rouge to Poe and Beau Brummel. Its father is Gertrude Stein, not Whitman, who despises it, though it will not admit it. Old women and children do not live in it. It does not harvest thought or associate with farmers. Remember again, this is the new American poetry. It does not serve in the army or follow a story. It revels in skewed cubes, elliptical appositions. It is inviolate, buttressed by its own skyhook aesthetics. You can't attack it, you know, because it has its own reason for being. It has a mysterious aesthetic by which it defends itself all the time. If you say poetry is supposed to be about something, a lot of these poets will tell you, well, what it's about is its own language as it moves along. That's what it's about. It's not supposed to be about people with problems or something like that. Ultramarine, British does that mean? Uppity? Ultramarine critics praise it, wash their hands of subject matter. It is tar baby without the baby, without the tar. Its city is not the city of pavement or taxis, business or bums. It dwells on absence and illusion, mirrors refulgent flames. Deer that browse beneath its branches starve. Its emotions do not arise from sensible objects. It passes rocks as though they were clouds. It sustains itself on paperweight petals. It does not flood out its muskrats. Thoreau again says, perhaps this will be the year we, we flood out our muskrats. You know, I think that's like improvement. It does not define, catalog, testify, or witness. It holds models before the young of a skillful evasion, withering heartlessness. It lifts its own weight for exercise, does not body block or break up double plays or countenance scar tissue. I just thought of something. William Stafford says, I love feeble poems. He doesn't mind if a poem isn't perfect, you know. Get said what you want to get said. These people don't want any scar tissue in their poems, you know. It flails in the foam, but has no body and cannot drown or swim. In his afterlife, Rambeau smuggles it along infected rivers. I heard the poet Louis Simpson say, can't understand anybody who wouldn't love Rambeau as a poet. I heard another poet, Richard Wilbur, said, Rambeau is a childish adolescent most of the time. You know, he stopped writing poetry by the time he was 17, became a gun runner, died of gangrene finally. In his afterlife, Rambeau smuggles it 
the new American poetry along infected rivers. So I take a lot of unpopular stands there, you know. That makes, the poem makes me a reactionary, really. You know, a 19th century poet or something like that. Someone fit for the chopping block. Well, anything on your mind now about anything I've said? Uh, you know that uh, poem I read, The Crane, about that beautiful Long Island pond? Well, uh, it seems to me the movement in my life, too, has been from that idyllic kind of childhood to the realization that at that, uh, the ashes of two to three million people were flushed into the pond at Auschwitz. You know? So there's that. And I did spend a long time, about over 20 years, I wrote about uh, 50 poems about the, uh, the Third Reich and Hitler and the Holocaust. They came together finally in a book called Erika, which is, I guess it could suggest a girl's name, but it's, the, uh, it's a heath plant that I saw growing over the mass graves at the concentration camp Bergen-Belsen in northern Germany. So I have down here now just, uh, I thought I'd read you two of these poems. I feel okay about the book as a whole. I think it makes a human statement somehow. That's a grand claim. Uh, considering the subject matter. But I am worried about reading just individual poems because they could offend people you know, with some of their slants. I'm going to read you a noisy and fragmented and obsessive one, and then I'm going to read you a very quiet one. This poem is called Darkness. Uh, the he in it is Hitler. I don't mention him by name in the whole book. And uh, I think the one thing you might have to know is that when people <coughs> perform autopsies and there's the smell of almond, an almond smell, it's associated with death by cyanide. So I think that might be the only thing you have to know. It begins with the speaker's worry that he will forget the camps, the concentration camps. Darkness, 30, 50, 80 years later, it's getting darker. The books read, the testimonies all taken, the films seen through the eyes' black lens, darker. The words remember, Treblinka green, Nordhausen red, Auschwitz blue, Mauthausen orange, Belsen white, colors considered before those places named themselves. 30, 50, 80 years later, now the camps, I lose them. Where are they? Darker. If it is true that I've always loved him, darker. If it is true that I would kill again, darker. If it is true that nothing matters, darker. If it is true that I am jealous of them, the Nazis hooked crosses, the Jews stripes. He speaks inside me, darker. I lie on a table in the Fuhrer's bunker, outside his chamber, in the hall, I am waiting. They do not see me, dogs nor people. This dream begins again, film circles and burns, 80, 50, 30 years, darker. He touched my forehead, he speaks now, says somehow lower, tells me to speak to the lower power, for once to say, come back, enter, I was once alive, darker. The air swims with words, hair twines the words, numbers along a wrist, along a red brick shower, darker. To forgive them, killer and victim, darker. Doctor, help me kill the Goebbels' children, darker. Across the street now, a cattle car, stalled. The skin lampshades darken under varnish, fragments. Can I call him back? Millions still call him back in deepest prayer, but the light diffused as spray, past Andromeda in spiral shadows, darker, always darker, SS, Death's head, oval, hollow, dead face, hole for boot, fragments. The heroes, all dead in the first five minutes, darker. To enter this darkness, 
to dig this chancellery garden to my own remains, to watch as the black face and scrotum, lacking one egg, stare up at the sun, to speak with that charred jaw, carrying this with me, darker, under the answer, under the darkness, this love I have, this lust to press these words. He tells me, lower, and the black breastbone aches with it, the last black liquid cupped in the eye socket smells of it, odor of cyanide's bitter almond, the viscera smeared to the backbone shines with it. For me to say it all, my hands around his neck, mouth to mouth, my lips to kiss his eyes to sleep. We will taste this history together, my friend. Take a deep breath, take it. Smell almond in the air, the leader lives. And this is a, uh, this is a little two-paragraph prose poem. It's called The Tree. And this town mentioned in here, Lidice, L-I-D-I-C-E, or Lidice, was a town in uh, Czechoslovakia that was leveled to the ground by the Nazis after two Czech partisans uh, ambushed and assassinated the uh, Nazi so-called, they call them protectors, protector of the area, Heydrich. So the Nazis leveled the town to the ground with no trace of it. They sent all the, they shot all the men. They sent all the women off to concentration camps where they died or killed. And they uh, also sent most of the children to the concentration camps where they were gassed too. But some of the kids that looked like Germans, they sent to, uh, they sent to, parents who wanted children in the Reich, you know. But they wanted Lydis not to exist, period, because of that one assassination. So this is just a little uh, prose poem. A little, bit, a little bit surreal, but you'll catch hold of it. It's called The Tree. Not everyone can see the tree. It's summer cloud of green leaves or its bare radiance under winter sunlight. Not everyone can see the tree, but it is still there, standing just outside the area that was once a name and the village, Lydis. Not everyone can see the tree, but most people, all those who can follow the forked stick, the divining rod of their heart to the tree's place, can hear it. The tree needs no wind to sound as though wind blows through its leaves. The listener hears voices of children, and of their mothers and fathers. There are moments of great joy, music, dancing, but all the sounds of the life of Lydis, drunks raving their systems, a woman moaning the old song of the toothache, strain of harness on plow horse, whistle of flail in the golden fields. But under all these sounds is the hum of lamentation, the voice's future. The tree is still there, but when its body fell, it was cut up and dragged away for the shredder. The tree's limbs and trunk were pulped at the paper mill. And now there is a book made of this paper. When you find the book, when you turn its leaves, you will hear the villagers' faces. I'm sorry. When you find the book, when you turn its leaves, you will hear the villagers' voices. When you hold the leaves of this book to light, you will see the watermarks of their faces. When I was putting together all these poems, I, was, I, I would have liked to put that first in the book, you know, but I didn't want it to refer to this book. When you hold the leaves of this book to light, you will see the watermarks of their faces, which sound like too much of a claim. So there's the little thing called the tree. Well, over about a dozen years, I wrote a poem, a book-length poem. Uh, came out in November or December. It has 52 sections. The greatest poem in the English language has 52 sections, Walt Whitman's Song of Myself. That's opinion, of course. But, uh, so this is 52 sections in homage to Whitman. I think this, this one's about 
for better or worse, probably for worse, twice as long as Song of Myself. And just as I wouldn't be able to tell you exactly what Song of Myself was about, it seems to be about a lot of things, I wouldn't be able to tell you what this is about. But it's called the Chestnut Rain, and it is about the American chestnut tree, which we lost in this country basically by about the 30s because of blight, uh, the chestnut blight. It used to be the dominant tree, in, at least in the American East, you know, but all across the country it was the dominant tree. No matter where you go now, you see Chestnut Lane and Chestnut Ridge and Chestnut Hill, and it was the, it was extremely useful tree. So it, that's one of the central images, but also somehow this poem is about, uh, it's about the American farmer, the kind of person we've, we're losing fast in this country. People who knew things, who knew how to do things, you know, who knew something about the land. Now, as Wendell Berry says, we understand the weather just in terms of whether or not we can play golf, you know. So it's about that. And it's also somehow about America's wars. I bring those things together. And there are other repeated uh, motifs. Well, I, th I thought uh, this was what I was mainly going to do. I have listed here uh, seven sections of this I'd like to read. I'll see what happens. Only, only one of them is uh, uh, longish. I'll read that first. I'll read the long one, the longish one first. This is the seventh section. It's called The Light. And I think it's a, it, it's a catalog, a Whitmanian catalog, and it mentions a lot of things that this whole uh, poem is about. Be with me in the light of this prism, for this is our earthly body again, solar light broken down, rays of decomposition, black, white-banded lines of the chestnut's possible resurrection, light of the house sparrow's chestnut nape, light of a child you love, its first six lunar months within its mother when cells move from matrix into cerebral cortex, light filling your palms valleys now if you'll open them, which is at last the easeful light of your loins and behind your eyes as you give yourself, man or woman, to the flow of words or semen. Light of the smallest atomic particle struck until split into particles its own size, miracle of the undiminished Lord. Light of the ocean nautilus swaying, its empty innermost chambers coiling back to their beginning. Light of the crystal lattice, light rising into grass at Arlington. Light of arctic night under the sliding pearl shelves. Light left in a dead human eye, curving outward, Light of trains rocking the last chestnut ties. Light of a new net strung on a rim mounted in a city alley. Light bursting upward with sidewalk pigeons, the full spectrum of their circling above the buildings, which is the light of which our daily light is shadow, red light that enters arterial blood. Light of morning cloak larvae that once fed on elm leaves which is the honey-grained light of a chestnut cupboard, light of half-moons drifting your father's nails, which is the light of goldenrod shade, light in spaces under snow-buried spruce boughs, which is the light of the abandoned farm, light of scattered boards of sheds sagging into lilacs and sumacs, which is the light of candling, blood spots balanced in the cosmos, which is the light of the black-capped chickadee's ministry, the milky light of a foal inside its mother above their meadow, light entering our third eye, light of the Buddha's ear, of Francis's tongue-tip tuned to beasts, which is the light of palm kelp rooted in rock, springing back against breakers until the simple light of waltz leaves unfolds, but sometimes ripped loose into the light of Landsberg and Mein Kampf, Aberrant light of killers working together, intricate black revolving light of the Holocaust, light shining from the last Bronx synagogue, light that shadows every Jew, the light of Belsen Haida, which is the spectral light of old Salem's invisible wonders, which is the light of chestnut rain, blossoms falling, nuts ripening in falling burrs, rain that reached those branches, rain of light through the toothed and thick-veined leaves, which is the light seeping from atomic waste into our future. Light of snappers crawling up from dead dioxin and Myrex swamps to die. 
Light of a pipeline burst above tundra. Light in the eyes of the last passenger pigeon. Light filling skin flaps over teepee openings, all facing east. Which is the light of Wyoming museum display cases holding Chief Joseph's axe, yellow hands, scalp knot? Which is the light of an Indian mummy curled in his grave, string of bear claw light still circling his neck? The dusky light painted by Albert Bierstadt on the flanks of the last buffalo winding away from their hunters? Which is the light of the cruise missile named Tomahawk? Which is the light of buffalo oil burning in a clay dish? Which is the clear, certain, and perfect light of Jonathan Edwards, but drunken light skidding the human family tree? Which is the light of leukemia water, but light traced in the wood of Jefferson's desk? Which is the light of William Schrader's mechanical heart, which he described as a threshing machine? but the slow sludge of poison light sliding into ocean trenches, but the quiet light of Bryant's fringed gentian, which is the light of the one smiling commuter in the packed car, standing, swaying, reading the Ramayana, which is the light of the plat at Red Buttes on the Oregon Trail where the river bends, where Robert Stewart camped in 1812 in the light of cottonwood still growing at the bend of the plat under the Red Hills, the transient, imploded, almost remembered light of the bare chestnut at evening and winter. Light of bottles buried back of our farms for hundreds of years. Blue of medicine, green of whiskey, amber of bitters, the bubbled translucence of mineral water flasks. Which is the light of the dead in the Battle of Long Island, in the shadow of the church at Shiloh, along the Marne at Chateau Thierry, under the Okinawa sand, in the Mekong Delta's mud, endless American roll call of corpse light. Which is the light of Fredericksburg, metal locks lifting into sulfurous air, settling again between the lines that trapped them. Light of oil still rainbowing above the Arizona at Pearl Harbor light falling into apple trees opened heads, which is the spiral light of the slave's hovel, which is the light of John Woolman's undyed clothes and journal, light of his mind frequently clothed with inward prayer, which is the light of the chestnut tampkin in the cannon's mouth, rhapsodic light woven by earthworms in coffins, which is the light of Alamogordo, the never-ending radiostrontium of a mother's milk, jugular light of our sunset rivers, light of radium children, which is the light of the dissolving chain and tropic light crawling from dawn along its own curled tail, which is the light lost to this earth forever, light of an aborted child. These lines, at least the loosened black light of plowing, light of the last holy chestnut leaves unfolding, edge of eternal light scything out from a dead star, light of ponds dusted with the last chestnut pollen, which is the light inside the tears filling our closed eyes as we praise and grieve. Uh, the, the rest of these sections are fairly short, I think, that I'll read. <clears throat> this is the 28th section. It mentions a poet, Li Po, a Chinese poet who lived a thousand years ago. It was autumn when Li Po heard a girl picking chestnuts by the shore humming, Night now, I must be home. His poem ends there. But the girl reached home, and that night dreamed of walking the shore again, where the chestnut wood gave her our song. Inside each chestnut she knew was night. Each was an eye in her fingers, and she, as she slept, could see with those chestnut eyes Rain in the dying trees a thousand years away, the trees, too, on their way home, in a beam of light, in a curve of time to where we and Li Po's girl resume that autumn dream. Uh, the 29th section. This is called Auction. Here, the speaker of the whole poem first sees and feels chestnut leaves. 
There's a sort of uh, literary reference in the middle of this poem to the kind of fiction that was so popular at the end of the 19th century, a very romantic fiction. I'm from Brockport in western New York. A woman novelist by the name of Mary Jane Holmes lived there. She was one of the best-selling novelists of the 19th century. You know, people like her sold all the books, not Hawthorne and Melville and the people we read now. Uh, she was the author of 39 American, uh, uh, one American literature history says she was the author of 39 stereotyped, stereotypical novels. I read, I've read only one. It, it really opens up with a woman poised on her doorstep, wondering whether she's going to go this way and follow her suitor, her country suitor, out to the country, to the cows, or whether she's going to go this way and follow her city suitor to the city. The whole, I mean, it's not a bad plot, but the way these things are told, uh, anyway, this is called auction. Late, I was in the back circle. Have you ever gone to a country auction? I'll start this again. I've gone to hundreds. Late, I was in the back circle. Just out of beginning rain, the auctioneer stood on a wagon, pulled to the central doors of a sagging barn, and sold. Rolls of barbed wire, tools, feed, furniture, depression glassware, a mirror, linens, a shotgun, Christmas decorations, all held up by his young helpers. Then, a box of books. I bid a dollar, and they were mine, passed back by a dozen hands. I knelt to sort them, knowing what they'd be, as they were, those same popular weeping novels of the century before. A woman, of course, who stands in her doorway, wondering whether to wed her city or her country suitor. A priest, of course, who loves the village's spinster teacher for 60 years of heartbreak without a word. You know what I mean. The language cloying, conventional, sublime that dazes and bores us. But there, too, in the bottom of the box, a scrapbook. And pasted on its first yellowed and chipped page, a photograph of the girl who'd kept it 70 years before, who'd pressed into it and labeled leaves she'd known. Oak and maple, apple, linden, black birch, catalpa, and then, still green in folds of waxed paper, American chestnut. These leaves bought at auction in arrogance in the gentle rain, but now down on my knees, eyes blurred in the light of dead trees, and the face of a girl who gathers the farm's beauty in fallen leaves, who needed to touch, touched, still touches these pages of the chestnut rain. I'll skip this one. A little bit too long. Forty-fourth section is called Diary Entry Nocturne. A fall ago, in rain, I planted a three-foot Colorado blue spruce, unballed it from burlap into a hole of mud I dug outside my window. The tree has taken, has pushed brown caps from new growth. As I enter this, the tree breathes starlight, as it will when I am dead. Here, in my new eyes, this is its first spring. How easily it shed the snow that buried it. Already, a pair of song sparrows nests within its complex darkness. Blue needles so sharp that no snake or owl could climb or strike through. Maybe without seeing them, except for knots of chestnut feathers at breast centers, they are plain streaked sparrow browns. You've heard their song. Three short spaced notes, all at the same pitch, then jumbles of trills in quick pitch changes, but the basic theme begun with three notes. The parent sparrows watched from an ash. I could just see in. Their eggs were greenish white, speckled and blotched in shades of bark reds and browns. Now I am nearer and nearer dead. 
What color is starlight under the four nestlings lids? How and from where does that other color enter their breast feathers? Evening rain begins again, seeps into branches where six song sparrows sleep. Listen, I am speaking from the center of the power holding all together. My voice remembers the nestlings' cheepings, the parents' full songs, their three spaced notes, the ascendant descending trills into the night, nocturne gathering rain and breathing blue tree, touching the nestlings' breast feathers and the listening dead and you with chestnut blood. Forty-five, the spruce in winter. Because the spruce is a creature of blue light, because it lives here in winter dusk as though to welcome slowly descending darkness, because two sparrows sang three notes until I listened, from this hour I again ordain myself, if I am the blood of blue sound into syllables, the one who hears spring sap hum in the holy tree, who tastes spruce blueness on the black air, be with me. I know that's a hell of a claim. That's exactly what Walt would do. He says, from this hour, I again ordain myself. So you make yourself into a priest who can hear. And then he says, if I am the blood of blue sound into syllables, the one who hears spring sap hum in the holy tree, who tastes spruce blueness in the black air. And then he asks, be with me. I'm a little self-conscious about that. There was a, re a terrible review of this uh, book in the uh, New York Times Book Review a while ago, and the guy picked out that part as my tremendous ego, you know. I just thought of some very dirty words, but that's okay. And uh, I'll read the final section here. It opens up with three, I won't read them, epigraphs. I found a... Uh, one poet and two naturalists who refer to the chestnut tree as an American ghost. Because I guess you'd come into the, you'd come into the woods and there would be this great white skeleton, you know, the chestnut tree went white. We still get, uh, we get lots of uh, sucker growths that come up out of the old roots. And then they get to be a certain size, the blight hits them and they're down. There are a couple of groves in America now. One in Michigan I read about and one in California. People keep sending me clippings. And they think maybe they can get a resistant uh, strain of the tree going, you know. <clears throat> well, the poem's 100 pages long, and after reading 98, you get to this last section. And I want you to pay attention to those three spaced notes, which from that other section are carried forward, you know. This is called Epilogue, the Ghost. As this was growing, I guess the poem or his whole expression or whatever, as this was growing, the chestnut burr sent me by a friend split open. One pearl, but natural, the tree's perfect seed floated inside. For a few minutes, I wet the pale nut in my mouth. It tasted like the smell of grass clogged under your mower, the smell of old barns then potted it in loam, watered it most weeks for two years, gave up on it. But a seedling broke surface, unfolded. It is still so small, little ghost, it cannot cast a shadow. Even its seed leaves are lobed smooth. The storied teeth will have to bite through soft gum to make their own edge. Ten hours a day, a plant light shines down on it, I want to care for it as though one day, if it lived, I could climb it to an afterlife, and you with me. Modern books tell me we and it and heaven are already dead. But last night, believe me, when the light above it was out, when I walked by on my way to sleep, the seedling spoke one word, or was that word, without saying it. The clay pot I'd placed it in shone like a silver chalice. The chestnut's several leaves were gauze white in light from nowhere. I stood there wanting to hear that word again, that bead of white tree sperm on my tongue, white of all colors, ghost light. 
Later, when I fell asleep deeper than I've ever been, I know I've told enough of mine. You have that dream, or my seedling will never flower that needs another if it's ever going to shower white blossom. So that's the end of the whole thing. Uh, it's just about time. Maybe I'll finish with one or two short poems. Here's a poem about a childhood hero of mine, Mickey Mantle. Mantle ran so hard, they said, he tore his legs to pieces. What is this but spirit? Fifty-four homers in 56, the triple crown. I was a high school junior, batting fourth behind him in a dream. He makes Brill Cream commercials now, models with open mouths draped around him, as they never were in Commerce, Oklahoma, where the sandy-haired, wide-shouldered boy stood up against his barn, lefty for an hour, Ruth, Garrick, then righty, DiMaggio, as his father winged him in, and the future blew toward him, now a fastball, now a slow curve hanging like a model smile. Boy, that's a love poem, you know, and it's a poem of great disappointment, you know. I mentioned the Brill Cream commercial there, but what I was really remembering, I saw uh, Willie Mays and Mickey Mantle make this uh, margarine commercial, Blue Bonnet, you know, and they were supposed to cry, I want my blue bonnet, I want my margarine, you know, it was just heartbreaking to see your heroes demean themselves in that way. I mean, it wasn't even funny. I'll do, I'll, I'll do just two more poems. This is one I don't quite understand, you see. This is called, <clears throat> this is called Red Wings. Listen to this guy. You know, I write poems, or maybe I use the pronoun I, as deeply and clearly out of myself as I can. But later on, in order to judge them, I have to look back at them and say, that guy saying the poem, he, otherwise I can't split myself. And I change over the years, you know, and the poems remain what they are. So anyway, listen to this guy. And I, as I listen hard to him, as I listen to him. Red wings, maybe you've noticed that around here, red winged blackbirds aren't rare, but aren't seen often either. But one morning I saw a hundred more feeding on seed I spread under a line of pines planted more than a hundred years before. Almost at rest, their feathers folded close. Only yellow wing bars break their black bodies. But when, all at once, as they did, they lifted that red. I've tried for a long time and maybe should to tell you how the disembodied red wings flared and vanished. I've lost them in every telling. So much for me. I could die now anyway. Could you? We will close our eyes and rest in case the red wings in slow motion assume again the flames they are and rise. You know, I was just writing that poem along and suddenly that guy said, I could die now anyway. Could you? I don't know what he means. Would he die out of despair or because he's seen the ultimate beauty, you know, the red wings flaring and vanishing? See, once in, I teach creative writing sometimes, you know, and the central argument I have to make from the beginning is we have to get over the notion that what a writer does is to have an idea and then to lay it out. That isn't the way writing gets written. A writer is not so much, a poet is not so much, William Stafford says, someone who has something to say, but someone who discovers a process whereby discoveries can be made. And that's the fun of it. If you think that what you do when you write is to express your ideas, you're out of luck. How many ideas do you have? You, have, you run into blank spots. But if you sort of begin talking, suppose I wrote a story now, the man stood by the two-pronged microphone. I don't know what might happen. It might turn into something good, you know. That's the way writing gets written. The last great free human activity on earth, the writing of poetry and fiction, I think. And I'll finish up with a little poem that I had in mind, especially if I find it. Well, I've got it in here. Oh, it's there. I remember a couple of summers ago, I had an argument with my daughter or something like that. I was feeling lousy, sitting outside, and I was thinking of, I don't know, going for a ride or something. But within a couple of minutes, I wrote this poem. 
It could be called just sunflowers, but I call it Brockport sunflowers. I've got a bunch of poems about my hometown, you know. <clears throat> Brockport sunflowers. If they could walk, they would walk slowly. They would shuffle onto the roads from their fields, lally gag into our village, sway on sidewalks, dangle their silly and beautiful heads. Sexless, they would not bow to women or shake men's hands with their leaves. Desiring nothing but sunshine and water, they'd peer into our shops with amazement. Seeing themselves in windows, they'd know themselves holy. They would love the children and listen to them all day long until the children were ready for bed. As the evening star rose in the heavens, they would nod goodbye to us, not having said a word, and return like walking halos to their fields. And finally, a four-line poem by Walt Whitman, right? He says, A Clear Midnight. This is thy hour, O soul, thy free flight into the wordless. Away from books, away from art, the day erased, the lesson done. Thee, as the soul, fully forth, emerging, silent, gazing, pondering the themes thou lovest best. What do you think the themes are that the soul loves best? Night, sleep, death, and the stars. How's that for a poem? Thanks a lot for listening to that. Uh, uh,